well, there are lots of questions, but related to the nuclear, the nuclear component of the submarine deal, the first question that immediately comes to my mind and the mind of experts in the region is, who is going to supply the nuclear fuel that is going to power these subs? This is actually a really critical question. There's been a lot of fanfare about how nuclear uh, Australia will not have nuclear weapons. Um, these submarines will not carry nuclear weapons. But there still is the question, will Australia be creating the highly enriched uranium that's going to propel these nuclear submarines? And if so, that's going to cause diplomatic, treaty-related, environmental, social, health, political issues, a very large number of them, not to mention make regional um, allies and, and um, adversaries very nervous. If, on the other hand, the U.S. is going to be supplying this highly enriched uranium, a, a very dangerous nuclear substance, then that elite alleviate some of the concerns, but not all of them. Yeah. So if the U.S. were to provide that enriched uranium to us for the propulsion of these submarines, how would it work? Well, basically, it's almost it's, it's as though we had a nuclear power plant, and this happens all around the world. Most countries with nuclear power don't actually create their own enriched fuel for it. Instead, they get fuel rods. Um, in our case, we would get fuel rods for the... Um, for the mini nuclear power plant inside the submarines. And in the case of nuclear submarines, the way the U.S. designs them, they're, only, they're designed to be uh, fueled only once. So we don't have to worry about refueling accidents. And so they're just delivered to Australia as part of, of the mini nuclear power plant. However, that doesn't mitigate all the risks. Uh, you know, there can be, what about when, when um, the nuclear sub is in dry dock? You know, how is that handled? Where will they be held? What if there are accidents while they're at sea in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? We have to remember that Australia does not have a nuclear industry. I mean, we do have ANSTO, um, some of the world leading experts in terms of medical and uh, nuclear related civilian research, but nothing related to military applications. There's no depth here. And so how do we expect to have Australians running nuclear subs um, handling this very dangerous material, not to mention the risks of potential accidents, which is relatively low given that the U.S. designs are pretty safe. But you never can tell, especially when you have people who haven't been trained on this, these types of materials their entire lives the way they have in the U.S. And so, Maria, how hard is it going to be to pivot then the industry in Adelaide from, you know, the type of sub submarines they've been building to these nuclear submarines? And to your point, you know, is it not time that Australia developed this knowledge? Well, it, it's, it will be a big pivot. Um, the U.S. design is very, very different from the French design. Um, not just that in terms of it was non-nuclear. I mean, it was a conventional propelled rather than nuclear propelled. But the U.S. design is, has a, there are a lot of differences. So basically, a lot of the work is going to have to be scrapped and redone. Of course, we have the gap between, um, you know, people that were actually working on it right now and they're not going to, uh, you know, be working on the U.S. nuclear subs for at least a couple of years. And so where do these people work? How do we keep people employed who have, have expertise? In terms of creating the type of training that we need in Australia, I absolutely. And in fact, the nuclear industry has been talking about this for a while. My understanding, there is only one nuclear engineering course in the entire country. And it was even hard to get that started up, and there are only a handful of students in it. So, you know, there are so many issues related to this, you know, sudden announcement, um, not the least of which are things like practical questions, um, you know, HR questions, um, education type questions. How are we going to have enough people, um, submariners, you know, construction workers, people who can handle the um, the submarines while they're in dry dock, et cetera? It's, there's a lot of complications. And my concern, the concern of a lot of people is that these haven't been sorted through, that it's just, oh, we have this warm glow, you know, the U.S., sharing this sensitive technology with us, you know, we're just happy to be part of that without understanding exactly what we're committing to and whether or not we have the national capacity to actually pull it off. Yeah, there, there was the sort of kind of sense of naivety which a lot of analysts have commented on. Um, do you think there was a simpler option for us 
to partner with the US and the UK uh, in this region, given we know that there are great concerns about China's increased aggression in the region? Yes, well, you know, there's there are a lot of options other than nuclear um, powered subs. And certainly, you know, people have been saying that the one good thing about this is that we've gotten out of the deal with the French, which really um, I was a critic of and many other people were critic of for a number of reasons, not the least of which the cost was too much to begin with and then has almost doubled um, and probably would, would have gone further. But for example, South Korea has just done a 30 month intense examination and they're using um, you know, electric submarines. You know, they've decided that's what will work for them. I'm not saying that would necessarily be what would work best for Australia. There's good reason to think about nuclear powered submarines because Australia has a, a huge maritime space to consider, but there are also significant disadvantages of nuclear submarines which don't seem to be considered at all in this debate. Yeah. And just finally, Maria, you know, there's often been a debate in Australia about whether we should enrich uranium. We have uranium. We could be enriching it and selling it. Do you think that would be too tricky a discussion and a debate to now have? Well, yes, this this debate has come up time, you know, multiple times, for example, with um, the, the most recent Rural Commission in, in South Australia on this whether or not nuclear waste should be taken and you can reprocess it and take out useful nuclear material and then resell it. And the analysis was that it actually doesn't make economic sense right now because uranium um, doesn't sell for that much because a lot of decommissioned nuclear weapons, the nuclear fuel is then used for um, civilian purposes. But there's a larger issue here. Um, there are very few countries in the world that enrich uranium. If you can enrich uranium for a power plant or for a nuclear submarine, you use the exact same equipment to enrich it for nuclear weapons. And so countries in the region would be shocked and startled if Australia said, we're going to be enriching uranium. The US, in fact, has led an effort against the um, uh, highly enriched uranium remaining in sites around the world and against countries trying to get enrichment technology. And so, uh, for example, South Korea has been arguing, why can't we enrich uranium? You know, we depend heavily on nuclear power and the U.S. has really uh, pressured against that and, in fact, um, was able to talk South Korea out of out of sort of demanding that. Yeah. And so this is it's a it's a political hot button it would regionally and globally have all sorts of repercussions it's not just a matter of sort of domestic australian interests yeah really great to chat to you tonight maria thank you so much for joining us no problem thank you